um, we're starting from page 143, a long way down. The Savar, ah, about 10 lines from the bottom. The Savar Rabbi Yehuda. In Perek Shneim Ve'esrim. In Chavit, what was Chavit? Chavit was a jug, wasn't it? A jug that was broken. Is that what it was? A cask that was broken. The wine cask that was broken with a stone on top and all that sort of thing. The Savar Rabbi Yehuda Stamasur. So does Rabbi Yehuda hold that? Uh, no say purpose. When there is no stated purpose for storing mulberries or pomegranates, it is forbidden to consume the juice that oozes out of them on Shabbat. Right. <clears throat> so you've got mulberries and pomegranates, which are an intermediate stage. Yeah. And I'm meaning they can have either, they can go either way, yeah. whether it's their food or the juice. Yeah. And if you didn't have any intention to eat them or use their juice, or I think it's anything at all on Shabbos. Yeah, you haven't designated them for any for specific purpose on Shabbos. Oh, that's what it says here. For no stated purpose, mm-hmm. it's forbidden to consume the juice that oozes out of them. Do they use the word ooze in there? Or leech or... Yeah, they say seeps. Seeps. Ooze, mm-hmm. seeps. But we learned in a Mishnah, Chalev ha'isha metame l'ratzon v'shelo l'ratzon. The milk of a woman will cause susceptibility to tuma. whether it's to satisfaction or not to satisfaction. Well, he's translated that, whether it was expressed volitionally or unvolitionally. That is much more clear. Because it says, metame leratzon v'shelo leratzon. With so intention or without intention? Exactly. Um, so, so, what's the full sentence as it's written there, Peter? Okay. Because read on. Uh, because okay. I think it falls. Chalev behema eno but the milk of an animal will only cause susceptibility to tuma if it was expressed. Volitionally. Volish. Volitionally. Volitionally. Is that a real word? Volitionally? By, of your yeah. own, of its own volition. Uh, uh, with the intention. With intention. Let's say with intention. Yes, I think that. So if it was um, expressed with intention. But not if it drips out on its own. Ah. That's what he's added. Yeah. Amar Rabbi Akiva. Kal v'chomer hu. It is known to us through a kalvachomer, meaning that animal milk is con- equivalent to human milk in this regard. Umachalev haisha, for if with the milk of a woman, she'enu meuchad ela liktanim, where its intention is only for children, metame laratzon veshelo laratzon, it will cause susceptibility to tumor, whether it was expressed uh, with intent or not with intent. Chalev shebehema, animal milk, shemeyuchad ben liktanim ben likdolim, intended for both children and adults, eno din shitame ben laratzon uven shelo laratzon. It's not logical that it should cause susceptibility to tumor, whether... Is it not logical? Oh, sorry. Is... It is not lo- Is it not logical that it should cause susceptibility to tumor, whether it was expressed with intent or without intent? Amrulo, im timei chalev haisha shelol ratzon. If the Torah designated as a cause of susceptibility, of susceptibility to tuma, the milk of a woman that did not, that was not expressed intentionally, shadam magefata tamei. Insofar as the blood of her wound causes causes susceptibility to tuma. Itame chalev habehema. Will it designate 
as a cause of, of susceptibility to tuma, the milk of an animal that did not that did not get expressed intentionally. Shadam Maikefata Tahor, when the blood of its wound does not cause susceptibility to tumor. I'll just read a little bit here, Peter. Yeah. For the only reason that a woman's milk that emerged unintentionally is legally considered a beverage is because it is like the blood of her wound, which has beverage status even though she is not generally desirous of its coming forth. The blood of an animal's wound, by contrast, is not considered a beverage altogether. Its milk will therefore not be considered a beverage unless its owner is content with its having come, with its having come, come forth. Do you have any notes or anything about this? Sorry, that's all difficult. Uh, I agree. As the blood of her wound renders food susceptible to ritual impurity, there is a special derivation cited by Rashi that teaches that human blood is considered a liquid. Therefore, if it comes into contact with food, it renders the food susceptible to ritual impurity. And uh, I, I seem to have learned this many years ago that, um, say, with fruit, it becomes susceptible to impurity if it's being washed. It has to be moistened first. What does the... The fruit itself. Ah, okay, yeah. So, uh, at the time it hasn't been washed, it's not susceptible to impurity. But once you wash it, it does. And I think that's the same idea that going may... on here. Oh, really? I think. There is no distinction in this regard between different kinds of human blood. Any kind of human blood renders food susceptible to ritual impurity. Animal blood that flows when the animal is slaughtered is also considered a liquid and renders food susceptible to ritual impurity. However, other kinds of animal blood are not considered to be liquids. So this is a situation of legal fiction, if you like. Mm. You know, because, I mean, these things are liquid, in fact. But only the blood of a slaughtered animal that flows at that point is treated as a liquid. Whereas any human blood, whether it's menstrual or whether it's a result of a wound, mm -hmm. is treated and as a liquid and creating the susceptibility to impurity. There's a very large note here. Can I yeah. read part of it to you? Blood that flows from one's wound is one of the seven beverages. Uh, this is mentioned here. Oh, ah, yeah? That render food susceptible to tumour. Do you want to read what you've got? Okay. Blood and milk. The sages listed seven liquids that render susceptible to ritual impurity foods with which they come into contact. Water, dew, wine, blood, oil, honey and milk. The inclusion of each liquid on this list is derived either from explicit verses or by means of the hermeneutic principles. The sages included milk because it is similar to blood in that both emerge from people. Indeed, the sages taught that in certain cases, blood becomes turbid and becomes milk. However, Rabbi Akiva stated that there is a specific verse that proves milk is a liquid in this regard, and that there is no connection between the halachot of milk and blood. His proof is that there are cases where milk is treated more stringently than blood. Therefore, milk is not considered a type of blood. So he's arguing with the sages who believed that milk was a, a variation of blood. blood. Mm. And you can understand why they came to that conclusion, because it comes, merges from a woman's breast. You know, blood would come out red from her arm, and obviously if a liquid comes out of her breast, it's blood that's been changed. You can understand the logic of when it's coming to it. I suppose there is a logic there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, 
I'll just keep reading one. It says here, blood that flows from one's wound is one of the seven beverages that render food susceptible to tumour. It's not really beverages, it's liquid. This is derived in Nidda 55b from one of the verses in Bilam's second set of prophecies concerning the Jews. The verse states, Badam chalalim yishter, and the blood of the slain it will drink. Allegorically, this verse concerns the capture by the Jewish people of the treasure of their enemies. And the blood of the slain it will drink. Literally, it speaks of a lion, which drinks the blood of its human prey. Now, by speaking of drinking the blood of the slain, the Torah classifies the blood of a dead human as a beverage, i.e., a liquid capable of generating susceptibility to tumour. This classification applies as well to blood that flows from one's wound. For since a person's blood contains his very life force, the loss of any of it from a wound constitutes one small measure of death. One who bleeds from a wound is thus considered in some degree to have been slain. That's very interesting. And his blood, like the blood of one who actually was slain, is legally re- regarded as a beverage. Now, one does not generally, generally look with satisfaction upon blood that flows from one's wound. Look with satisfaction. Now, look with satisfaction is a very strange... Mm. Now, one does not generally look with satisfaction upon blood that flows from one's wound. Wound, Nonetheless, the Torah classified it as a beverage. We see that although the attainment of beverage status generally requires an owner to regard the liquids coming into being with satisfaction, this is not so in the case of blood. Rather, blood will render food susceptible to tumour, even if it did not issue forth to one's satisfaction. I see. So there needs to be this comparison between milk and blood Mm -hmm. to find out whether milk renders something susceptible, creates a tumour status. If you if you consider it like blood, mm. <clears throat> this verse in Numbers speaks of blood from a human's wound. The blood from an animal's wound, however, whether from an ordinary wound or from a death wound, is not regarded as a beverage at all, and thus will not ever generate susceptibility susceptibility to tumor. It's very bad thing, you know, not a beverage, but it actually translates it all. So it's a liquid capable of transmitting impurity or creating you know, the, the, the situation where impurity can be transmitted. But to use the word beverage, which suggests that <coughs> drink it. Drink it. Well, it was only spoken about as drinking in terms of the lion. Mm. And by and large, of course, uh, the lion only gets you think, the blood at the moment of killing because your blood stops flowing once you're dead. Um, mm. You know, if you've ever seen any of those channels where it shows... The killing of cattle. The killing, well, where a lion kills a zebra mm. or whatever it kills. I don't necessarily recall any particular part where it's drinking the where blood. Where it's lapping up the blood. Yeah. Maybe it laps it a little bit, mm. but it's really just eating. Mm-hmm. Chomping away. And certainly when it goes for its neck, it's not as if it's sucking anything. No. What it does is it grabs on and just holds. Yeah. And just holds. Hope, either hoping to cut off its wind mm. or uh, um, blood to the head or yeah. to break its neck. Yeah. The sages employ this difference between human blood and animal blood to counter Rabbi Akiva's attempt to derive the law of animal milk from that of women's milk. For say the sages, the only reason women's milk extracted unintentionally generates susceptibility is because milk is in reality a product of blood, as you suggested. Thus, just as a woman's as they, <coughs> as they believe, thus just as a woman's blood that emerges unintended is regarded as a beverage, so too is its product milk regarded as a beverage even if it emerges unintended. But an animal's blood is not regarded as a beverage altogether. Since its milk is therefore subject to the usual rules governing beverage status, it will not generate susceptibility susceptibility to tumour unless it emerges to the satisfaction of its owner. Okay. In this case, 
it's the owner, the man who owns the cow, who owns it, or is it the the cow <laughs> that gives the milk to its child, uh, uh, to its calf, and there are satisfaction from that. So now we're on page 144. Amalahin, Rebbea Kiva Sitin, Nachmira Nibachalav Nibdam. I consider milk to be more stringent than blood. Shehacholev Lirfua Tame, for if one milks an animal for therapeutic reasons, the milk will cause susceptibility to toma. Vamakiv Lirfua Tahor, but if one bleeds an animal for therapeutic reasons, the blood will not cause susceptibility to toma. Amrullah, the sage said to Rabbi Akiva, Sale zit azaitim vanavim yochichu. Baskets of olives or grapes will demonstrate that liquids that come forth unintentionally cannot be compared to liquids that come forth to the satisfaction of their owner. Why not just say intentionally? Shehamashkin hayotin mehen. For the liquids that ooze from these baskets, Loratun uh, smehin, intentionally they will cause susceptibility to tumor. The deemed beverage shalola return to horim, and not intentionally, they will not cause susceptibility to tumor. That's not what is uh, said here. Go ahead. They said to him, the case of baskets of olives and grapes will co- prove that there is a difference between liquids that, that emerge of it, its own volition and those that do not. As liquid that <coughs> keeps from them volitionally. Mm-hmm renders food susceptible to ritual impurity. Hang on. That's right. However, liquid that seeps from them unvolitionally right. is ritually pure. Right. That's what I said. I didn't think that was what you said. Okay. Maybe I misheard. That is, it does not render ah. food susceptible to ritual impurity. Because, aha, uh-huh, because, I'll tell you why. Because, you, because the Hebrew word here is tehorim, which is properly translated there by Stein Salter's yeah. Tahor, pure. Yeah. And here, they say, will not cause susceptibility to Tuma. Oh, they've... They've used the negative of the uh, Tuma, which they shouldn't have. They should have used the Tahor. Yeah. To, to maintain the consistency of their language and the translation. So it's silly. But it is silly. My love, Lord, son, Nicha Le, does not to satisfaction or with intent or mm-hmm. what was the other word you used? Volitionally. Volitionally. Doesn't that mean that the owner of the fruit is satisfied about the liquid oozing? Seeping. Shalola Ratson Bistama not to his satisfaction does that mean that he makes no intentional statement uh, he says is referring to an indeterminate situation where he expressed no preference. The same sort of expressed no preference. Hmm. Well, now, if Now, if with olives or grapes, divne schita ninhu, which are for squeezing, shalola ratam velachlum. Uh, the liquid that comes out is not in te- uh, not intended, mm. is not regarded as a beverage at all. Fair enough, actually. Yeah. You wouldn't want the owner wouldn't want anything coming out until squeezing time. No. Tutim verimonim berries and pomegranates, delav beneath chitaninhu, which are not. Ne- necessarily designated for squeezing. Lokol Shiken, isn't it certainly true that the liquid that came from them is not considered a beverage? Does not render food susceptible to ritual impurity. Ah. It really is. And that makes, uh, I think, a bit more sense in mm-hmm. context. Lo, no. <laughs> Liratson Bistama. Satisfaction or with intent means that the owner makes no statement about his intent. (laughs) 
Shalolaraton de Gale Adate. Not to satisfaction means that he actually told of his intent, revealed his intent. Damar, in as much as he stated, Lo Nihali, I do not find it satisfactory. So I don't want the liquid oozing out. The bait ema shani sale zetim vanavim. Or if you wish, you may say, olives or grapes in baskets is different. Meaning the liquid that comes out of them when they're in the baskets is a different case. Kevan dil ibud kaime me ikara abkure mafkare lehu. Since it stands to see through, as in what else is good, what what else do you expect to happen? I think that's what it means. And be lost. They're abandoning the juice lechachila at the outset. Makes sense. <clears throat> uh, in that case, we indeed assume that there being no indication to the contrary, the owner is in fact satisfied with the emergence of the juice. What? Yes. Ah, oh, he is satisfied with the emergence of the juice, meaning he doesn't care about it. Well, in a way. He, what it's saying is because. If it comes out, he has no intention for it. It's, it's retention. Yep. It's coming out. He's negated it in a sense. You know, he doesn't expect that it. it's got no yep. uh, value for it. He's added here, Schweizer's yes. after that. Yes. No proof can be cited from this Mishnah. Generally speaking, however, the legal status of liquids that are not designated to be lost from the outset is that of liquid, <coughs> even if one did not express pleasure with their emergence. So he's saying that this really only applies to the uh, <coughs> olives and grapes in the basket. Other stuff, you know, it wouldn't apply. Ashkechan, Rabbi Yehuda de Mode, we have found a source. The Rabbi Yudah agrees with the rabbis regarding the oozing from the olives and grapes. Rabbanan de modu leila Rabbi Yudah bisha peirot minalan. From where do we know that the rabbis agree with Rabbi Yehuda regarding other fruits? Titania, us totna brisa. Sochatin, we may squeeze. There's so the top of 144B. The figin. What do you have? Plums. That's plums, good. I was going to say that sounds a lot like figs. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, plums, or the prishin, quinces. Yeah. Or the uzradin, or sorb apples. Yeah, it's got crab apples. Crab apples. Which are very sour. So, um, the it's sense more is... sour apples. So it says we can squeeze from these on Shabbat in order to drink their juice. Uh, Have you ever tried to get juice out of, out of a quince? Apple. Out of a quince? Mm, a plum you might be able to. Yeah, definitely a plum, but a quince, that's like a hard... Yeah, it's very hard. A valo berimonim. But not... We can't squeeze a pomegranate on Shabbos. Ah, so fruits that are not generally designated for squeezing, you can squeeze. Mm. <laughs> and pomegranate, which has a designation for squeezing, you can't. Okay. The Shalbet Menashia bar Menachem Hayu Sochatim Brimunim and the household of Menashia bar Menachem would squeeze pomegranate string weekdays and therefore you wouldn't be able to do it on Shabbos. Or yeah. Mikai de Rabbanan here, from where do you know that this is what the, ra- the rabbis say? Dilma Rabbi Yehuda here. Perhaps it's only the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. But to have nami Rabbi Yehuda, let it be Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. 
Ema Dishmat Leil Rabbi Yehuda. Can you say you have, you have heard this from Rabbi Yehuda in our Mishnah? You know, I might have made a mistake. Is Rabbi Yehuda perhaps Rabbi Yehuda Nasi? I don't think it is though. I don't know. Okay. I would have thought it was Yehuda Nasi. Mm. I have to clarify that. Yatsumatman. If they oozed of their own accord, you can you're allowed to consume them. Sochatin the chachila mishamat le, but about initially squeezing. Have you heard it? Of that Rebbe Huda permits this. Elamai itla for What then must you say? Kevan zilav benes chita minhu since. They're not designated for squeezing. Uh, even initially, uh, oh, it says he permits. Since they're not generally for squeezing, mm. uh, like the plums, quince, or yeah. crab apples, you would assume uh, Rabbi Yehuda would say, even at yeah. the outset you can squeeze them yourself. You can even say that this is what the rabbi said. Kevan de lo benes chita ninhu. They agree. They probably agree that since these fruits are not for squeezing normally, I feel lechachila even initially. He could squeeze them. Shabbos. Shema mina. Rabbanan here. You can learn from this that this is the opinion of the rabbis. Shema mina. Indeed. Learn from this. Shall Beit Menashe Bar Menachem Hayu Sochatim Brimonim? The household of Menashe Bar Menachem would squeeze pomegranates on the weekdays. Amar Av Nachman. Halacha. By the way, do you have anything about Menashe Bar Menachem? Um. Okay. Well, it says no. Does Menashe Ben Menachem constitute the majority of the world? Mm. Really? Good question. The discussion concerns the following questions. Is the behavior of individuals, e.g. in terms who squeeze pomegranates, irrelevant to determine in halakha or the general population? Or is the fact that some individuals act in a certain way enough of a factor to determine what that, that conduct or practice is normative? Mm. So can we hold them up as a example yes. of um of the general I suppose it's, you know if you read that the household of uh, uh, yeah. uh Moshe Feinstein yeah. squeezed uh, pomegranates yeah. during the week. Mm. That would be enough for you with your film. But so many times we've read in the Talmud that, you know, the rabbis, the big ones, did it a different way because they're more discerning. The general conclusion would be that it's okay to squeeze pomegranates during the week. And if, by extension, the family didn't do anything on Shabbat, then you would take it that it's not to be done on Shabbat. It's Menashe Bar Menachem. We don't know who he is. No, we don't know who he is. But, uh, uh, um, just look on there. Imagine, uh, imagine if they looked around to each other and said to themselves, who can we think of that's just like the regular run-of-the-mill kind of guy that we all like <laughs> and we all respect? Who well, can we hold up as the, the common standard? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's me! <laughs> <laughs> so that, that in itself, you know, treating that seriously... That is a good counter-argument to the one that I put up. The yeah. fact that this person... Like, why don't they talk about what? They, they haven't condemned it. They're applying this as oh, a to the common person, to the regular. Well, that's and if one. they're not condemning, the rabbis aren't saying, and... Or at least not yet. Well, not at this point. <laughs> the household of you know, this person behaved wrongly, yeah. then you must take it that... They're approving of the behaviour. 
The Barossa cites this case of Menashe's household as an example of the many people who regularly squeeze pomegranates to obtain juice. And that's in the talks about it in the base yourself. The fact that there are large numbers of people who regularly squeeze pomegranates for their juice establishes pomegranates as fruits designated for squeezing since their juice is never considered a beverage. Its extraction is prohibited. Makes it, 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 it creates a problem because obviously if it's the standard, then how could the Rebbe Huda and the rabbis be have just permitted it? But the other thing, of course, the other question it raises is why aren't they saying, um, or why aren't they including pomegranates in with um, plums, quinces, and apples? No, with uh, olives and what was the other thing? That grapes. And olives and grapes. If the normal way of dealing with pomegranates is squeezing. is squeezing, then it should be with the first. That's a good point. Except we know that they're in an intermediate. Well, we we know because we've been told before this that they're intermediate. But this seems to be saying now that it, it's a normal practice. Mm. Let's keep going. So, shall be Menashe Bar Menachem Hayu Sochatim Berimonim. They would squeeze pomegranates on weekdays. I'm a Rav Nachman. Halacha Keshel Beit Menashe Bar Menachem. It follows, Rav Nachman said, uh, the halacha follows the household of Menashe Bar Menachem, meaning it's prohibited. Amar le on Shabbos. Amar le Rav le Rav Nachman. Menashe ben Menachem Tanahu. Is Menashe ben Menachem a disputant in this Baraisa? Meaning, we just used his case as a support of the Tana. Who prohibits? Why would you go... He stands at the slightly difference. Go on. Rav has said to Rav Nachman, Is Menashe ben Menachem a Tana? Did you say that the Halakha is mm. in accordance with his opinion? Oh yeah, Menachem Tanahu. Mm. Is he a Tana? And if you'll say the halacha follows this tan, this tana, who uh, uh, who rules in accordance with Menashe ben Menachem, meaning that it's prohibited. Umishum to sava kim kim nashia, sorry kim nashia. Ben Menachem Halacha Kmoto. But because this Tana is in accordance with Menashe Ben Menachem, the Halacha follows him. Menashe Ben Menachem have a Rubab de Alma. Menashe Ben Menachem is the majority of the world. Meaning, is he? the majority of the world. Yeah. Ain, yes. Ditnan, we learned it in a Mishnah. Hamakayim kotim bekerem, if one maintains thistles in a vineyard. Rabbi Lazam Omer, Kidesh, he has rendered the grapes forbidden, for benefit. Oh, that's based on Kilaim, which I've just read this morning. You shall not sow your vineyard with this barret species, lest it become forbidden, Fullness of the seed they all sow and the produce of the vineyard. That's interesting. If I had, if you had have asked me if thistles in a vineyard are kilaim or not, based on thistles, yeah. is that what you've got? Thistles? Um, no. What have you got? It just. Hamakaim uh, kotim bekerem. He doesn't mention thistles. That's part of the... Yeah. But we have learned in the Mishnah. In the case of this kind, blah, 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 blah. as we learned in the Mishnah that addresses the prohibition of diverse kinds, particularly forbidden food crops in a vineyard, uh, with regard to one who maintains thorns ah, okay. in a vineyard. So thorns. Rabbi Eliezer says, he rendered the crops a forbidden mixture of food crops in a vineyard. The rabbis say, only a crop that people typically maintain renders a vineyard forbidden. Hang on. The Chachamim Rim, and Makadash Ela Davashik Mahu Mekayimin. 
No species is rendered forbidden except one whose like is maintained. Yeah, uh, that's exactly what I would have said based on the Rambam I read this morning. Now, my Rabbi Chanina, my time to Rabbi Eliezer, what is... Do you have Rabbi Eliezer or Rabbi Elazar? Yeah, we've made a mistake. What is Rabbi Eliezer's reason that uh, you're not allowed to have thistles in a vineyard? Shken be'aravia mekaimin kotzei sadot ligmalehem. For in Arabia, people maintain field thistles for their camels to eat. Likewise, with regard to Menashe ben Menachem, although he is but a single individual, his practice will cause pomegranates to be universally regarded as being designated for squeezing. So his expansion here is, there thorns are treated as a bona fide crop. Yeah. According to this opinion, since thorns are maintained in one place, they are considered to be significant everywhere. Right, and the, the same, same problem. reasoning applies to the issue of juicing pomegranates. Last time we if we hold him again. up to doing this, perhaps what might be considered a strange practice, yeah. and putting that, making that the norm mm-hmm. for everyone. Midi iria, is this any proof? Daravya, tra. Arabia is a place. Arabia is a place uh, with many people. Hacha batla dato etzel koladam here. With Menashe Ben Bar Menachem, his opinion is negated by everyone else, meaning no one else do, may may very well do it like him. Irrelevant by the opinions of all other men. Mm. Ella, Hain Tama Kidrav Chista. Rather, this is the reasoning in accordance with Rav Chista. So this is the reasoning of Rav Nachman. What was Rav Nachman? Rav Nachman said. That if the halacha follows the household of Menashe ben Menachem, that prohibits. So, um, this is the reasoning in accordance with Rav Chista, Dama Rav Chista, Tradin Shishatan Un Tanan B'mikveh. About beets that one squeezed and the juice was placed into a mikveh. Poslin et ha mikveh. The juice will invalidate the mikvah by a change in the appearance of the water. Mm. And apparently any liquid that causes the water of a ritual bath to change colour invalidates a ritual bath. When we get to the end of this bit, there's Thorns in a vineyard, Halakha, and Arabia is a place which you might like to talk about. Mm. Let's talk about it now. Okay. Uh, Arabia is a place. Rashba says that Arabia is a place where people commonly raise camel. Their custom is to cultivate thorns as camel fodder. Consequently, the custom in Arabia should impact the assessment of normative behaviour in places where people raise camels. On the other hand, there was no particular reason for the custom of people of the house of Menashe and and therefore the personal preferences are irrelevant to determining general halakhic norms. Well, that's what we worked out for ourselves. Thorns in a vineyard, the halakha. If plants that are not generally cultivated grow on their own in a vineyard, and most people in that area do not sustain those plants. They do not constitute a forbidden food crop in a vineyard. Good. This is so even if the owner of the vineyard wants to use them to feed his animals and the like, in accordance with the opinion of the rabbis. And then there are Good. five or six different authorities. A mikvah is valid only filled with water. Other liquids are not, are not suitable for mikvah use. Moreover, the mikvah must retain the appearance of water. Therefore, if one pours into a mikvah a liquid that will change its colour, the mikvah is rendered valid. It makes no difference how much foreign liquid is added, even a tiny amount will invalidate the mikvah as long as it alters the water's colour. It stands in contrast to the law of Maim Shilvim, drawn water which will only invalidate a mikvah if it measures at least 
free login, according to Rashi. Okay. So if you were a vicious-minded secularist, you sneak into the mixer and phone and put a bit of uh, food company in, change the water and cause a hell of a lot of trouble for you. Yeah, that's very interesting, really. Yeah. Unless you can... Um, Maybe there's an argument that there was no intention. No, the intention was to spoil things. <laughs> okay, so I think. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Onwards. Vahala Vanes Kita Ninhu. Now, beats are not designated for school. That's really interesting. Maybe that's actually a little bit of a reason why they make sure that there is absolutely nothing on your body at all. Mm. At all, at all, at all, at all, at all. Jana was a mix of lady for a while. Oh, really? In Where? Sydney. Here, in Sydney. In Sydney. Oh. And, uh, yes, she used to have to check people out, make sure there were no band-aids on their feet, between their toes, and various other things. That's very interesting. Mm. Some uh, unpleasant woman accused her of, you know, just other people of flipping up women's breasts. Wonderful. And Joanna used to make women lift their own breasts so she didn't touch them. Mm. This one spread stories about her. Ella May, eat lach what then must she say? So, hang on. Beats are not designated for squeezing. So you could do it on Shabbos, right? A mikvah, however, can only be invalidated by a liquid that possesses beverage status. Ella may eat lach What then must you say? Kevan de ach shvin hu hava lehu mashke. Since, when you squeeze the boot, the beat, he gives the true significance. Mm. It is considered a beverage, even though it's not generally accepted, mm. but it is given that significance. Hachanami, here too. Kevan de ach shvinhu havalahu mashke. Since he gives the true significance as a beverage. This is pomegranate juice we're now talking about. Ah, very good. It is regarded as a beverage, and therefore you can't use it on, do it on shop. There's a huge paragraph here, but I think we're getting the gist of it real. Rav Papa Amar, Mishum Dehave Deva Sheeno Simimeno Mikveh Lechaspila, because it is a substance from which one may not initially make a mikveh, the whole Davash Eino Simi Menu Mikveh Lechetil, and any substance from which one may not initially make a mikveh, Posel et a mikveh, the Shinui Mare, will invalidate the mikveh by a change in the appearance of water. And therefore, it's saying that the beverage, that the substance that changes the colour doesn't necessarily have to be a legal beverage. Tanan Hatam, we learned. One of vinegar or olive water fell into the mikvah and changed its appearance. Puzzle! It's invalid. I hope we're going to get onto the topic of white wine and white vinegar, which would not change its appearance. Man tana de mochal mashkehu. Who said that about olive water? Which tunnel was that? Amar Abaye, Rabbi Yaakov, Ditanya, Ustona Brisa. Rabbi Yaakov Omer, mochal harehu kamashke. Olive water is like a beverage. Uma Ta'am Amru Mochalayot Tahor. 
What then is the reason they said that olive water that comes out at the beginning of pressing it is not is is tahor. Is that correct? Is ritually pure. Is ritually pure. Again, they've done the not susceptible to tumor. What then is the reason they said the olive water that comes out at the beginning of the pressing is ritually pure? Meaning that it does not render food susceptible to ritual impurity. It is not because the olive discharge is not considered a liquid, but, and then you go to the transpiration. Mm-hmm. Because the owner does not desire its existence. The owner would prefer that the olive discharge not yet emerge and instead emerge together with and mix with the oil. Because it increases the bulk of what it produces. I get that. That's very good. Very good. Rabbi Shimon Omer. Mochal eno kamashke. Olive water is not like a beverage. So it's not susceptible to tumor. Oma ta'am. Amru mochal hayotim mi'ikul beit habad tameh. What then is the reason they said the olive water that flows from the netting of the olive press is susceptible to tumor? He translates this as olive sap that emerges from the bale of the olive press the olive, the after the olives were pressed. Read your... Rabbi Shimon says, the legal status of olive discharge, he calls it not olive water, yeah. Yeah. is not like that of a liquid. And what is the reason the sage has said that the olive sap that emerges from the bale of the olive press after the olives were pressed is mm. capable of rendering food susceptible to become ritually impure mm-hmm. because it is impossible to mm-hmm. shemen. Go on. that it will not contain drops of oil that come with it from the olives. Well, ah, okay. Okay. My Bena Yehu. What's the difference between Rabbi Yaakov, Rabbi Yaakov and Rabbi Shimon? Ika Bena Yehu de Ate Batar Itzatsta. The difference between them is the olive water that comes out after the pressure of the netting, is that right? After extensive pressing, it puts down. According to Rabbi Yaakov, it is considered a liquid and renders food susceptible to ritual impurity. And according to Rabbi Shimon, it is not a liquid and does not render food susceptible to impurity. Rabbi Amar, Mishum Dehave Devasha Enosin Himenu Mikve, because it is a substance from which one may not make a mikvah. Or for sell it a mikvah, be shinui mare. It invalidates the mikvah by a change in the appearance of the water. Meaning that it does need to be a legal beverage to make the to make it invalid. Amar Rabbi Hurama Shmuel, Sacheta Dameshkol shall anavim latokhakdera. Um Amar Rabbi Yudah Mashmuel, Rabbi Yudah said in the name of Rabbi Shmuel, Sochet Adam Yishkol, Shalanavim Latoch HaKadera. A person may squeeze a cluster of grapes into a pot. With food in it, he said. Into a pot of food on Shabbat. Avalo Latoch HaKadera. But not into a bowl or straight into an empty bowl, I assume. Yeah. Amar Rav Chista, Midivri Rabbeinu Nilmad, we can learn from the words of our teacher. Cholev Adam ez letoch ha one may milk a goat into a pot. Aval lo letoch ha but not into a bowl. Yeah, you 
you can may milk a goat into a pot of food on Shabbat because it is not considered to be the manner of squeezing that is prohibited as a subcategory of the labour of threshing. However, one may not do so into an empty bowl. The Gemara deduces, apparently he holds that a liquid that comes into food is not considered liquid, but rather it is. A woman candidate to join us here when I heard the voice. Yeah. So what did we just say? Okay, that that we went back in essence to what we were discussing last Shabbat where you could squeeze lemon right into the food. And isn't it amazing that it actually tells us that? And And does does that say that, is that the halakha as well? Is there a halakha about it? uh, Yes, there is. It is prohibited to milk an animal into an empty bowl on Shabbat and on a festival. However, on a festival, it is permitted to milk an animal designated for eating, provided the milk goes directly into a bowl of food to improve the food or into a bowl with breadcrumbs that will absorb the milk. (laughs) However, one may not milk all one's animals into a bowl with just one piece of bread in it. Nowadays, several authorities take into consideration the discomfort animals experience when they are not milked and allow milking into utensils containing just one piece of bread. Okay. Uh, we see that Shmuel holds that a beverage extracted for food is itself uh, regarded as food. But he says... Is not considered liquid, but rather it is food. Mativ Rami Barhama Zav Shekhalev et Haez Hechalav Tame Zav milk to goat. The milk is Tame. The E Amrat Mashke Habala Ochalin Ochel Hu, but if you say a beverage extracted for food is itself food. With what does it become susceptible? To ritual impurity. Can I read the whole of that? Because he's got a very big expansion here. Rami Bahama raised an objection from the following Mishnah. In the case of a Zav who milks a goat, the milk is ritually impure, whether or not the Zav actually touched it, as a Zav renders items ritually impure simply by moving them or being moved by them, even without direct contact. contact. And if you say that the liquid that comes directly into food is food and not liquid, in the case of one who milked directly into a pot of food, the milk should be considered food, the halakha is that food cannot become ritually impure unless it is rendered susceptible to ritual impurity by through contact a beverage. with a liquid. With what liquid was this milk rendered susceptible to ritual impurity? Question mark. Very good. Kidama Rabbi Yochanan. As Rabbi Yochanan once said about the milk of a tummy woman, Batipa Hameluch Alpi Hadad, with a drop of milk that is smeared upon the opening of the nipple, uh, so at that point it's susceptible to tumor. In order to moisten it and facilitate nursing or milking. Hachanami, here too, with goat milk, but tipa hamilochlechet alpi hadad, with a drop of milk that is smeared on the opening of the nipple. Mati Rabina. Ravina challenged. So the next part of the Mishnah says, Tmei met shesachat zeitim v'anavim, one contaminated with corpse tuma, who squeezed olives or grapes. 
ביצה מכוונת טהור, if they're precisely equivalent to an egg, the liquid extracted will not be contaminated. The liquid is ritually pure. So someone who is tummy, from a, they, from a corpse, they squeeze olives or grapes to the size of, to the volume of an egg. To the exact volume of an egg. Ah, to the present, right? The liquid extraction will, will not be contaminated. So, I mean, that immediately raises the question, so if it's a bit less or if it's a bit more, will it contaminate? Will it contaminate it to be continued?